welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. The topic for this month's show is the Space Shuttle Program, and with me here in the studio to bring us this lively topic <laughs> is Kevin Medden. Kevin, uh, welcome back to the side of the camera. I don't know how lively it is, but... <laughs> well, it's an interesting topic for those of us who like space. But it, you know, it, it was, for the, it's what happens when you go to Florida. You try to figure out where you want to spend your time, and for those of you out there who have not visited the Kennedy Space Center, just a really brief interlude. They have a bus tour, which you must take to see everything, but, you know, what, you know it, it covers the Apollo program and the shuttle program and the, and the space station, and hence the topic of this show, the space shuttle, because I believe the, we, we retired all our shuttles in 2011, and by 2013, NASA had this... Uh, wonderful facility built at the uh, Kennedy Space Center. So that's the new exhibit down at the Kennedy Space Center? Yes, and uh, and it stands to reason that the Kennedy Space Center would get a shuttle, but well, sure. you might be wondering, well, where are the other ones? Yeah. Well, Endeavour, which was the one that replaced the Challenger after the Challenger accident, made its way to a museum in L.A., so the West Coast folks are happy. And you might probably imagine that Smithsonian would get one because, I mean... Sure. Yeah. However, don't go to the mall, Smithsonian uh, Air and Space Museum, to see the shuttle. You have to go to the annex, which is at Dulles Airport, because they have the bigger hangar, because obviously you wouldn't want a shuttle to become weather beaten. It's too right. valuable of a tool to educate people. And, of exactly. course, the Kennedy Space Center ended up with Atlantis. And for Star Trek fans, yes, Enterprise is still around. And it can be found on the USS Intrepid, which is an aircraft carrier in the harbor at New York City. But it's basically, you know, a museum. It's, it has everything from the Concorde to uh, one of the SR-71s to the Space Shuttle Enterprise, which, for those who don't remember, was actually the test bed, the one that they tested on the 747 to make sure it could lift off from the 747 while in flight. Oh, yeah. And it was the one that used, you know, they were, that was the one that tested the glide pattern to make sure it could glide, you know, safely under, you know, without power, obviously. Sure, yeah. So that's where they're all located. All right. So uh, when we get down to uh, this new exhibit at the Kennedy Space Center, uh, what do we see when we first walk in the door? Well, like a lot of museums, this particular exhibit is going to take you to a movie first. Because okay. they, they want to brush you up on what you're about to see. But before we get that far, there's a, there's a sign that indicates you're in the right place. Well, that's a good thing. Yes. And, and there's a better shot, and that's the uh, mock-up of the um, external fuel tank plus the two uh, SRBs, which is the, um, the rocket boosters on either side, which, of course, we all remember in Challenger gave us a problem with the O-rings. Exactly. And this shot was taken before the building for Atlantis was actually built. This is when it landed at the center, and they put it on this trailer, because obviously you don't want to roll the shuttle and have somebody have to steer it. That doesn't, right. just right. doesn't make sense. No. So essentially, once you get inside the building, as I said you know, previously, you, you see a movie which was kind of the aerospace type of thing where that we reminded you that the Wright brothers were the first to fly, yada, yada, yada. And sort of a history of aviation. Yeah, to kind of, you know, whet your appetite for, you know, what, your, what, what adventure you're going to see once these big, you know, doors open. And, of course, as you might imagine, they went for the dramatic money shot, okay. which was open the door, and what do you see? Atlantis. And as you can see there, Don, they, they chose to give you the angle that previously only an astronaut would have seen the bay door that way with the uh, Canada arm coming out of it in space. So rather than just drop it on the floor and let everybody look at it, this way it's, you have a better chance of doing a walk around. Plus you can actually see up inside the cargo bay. Correct. Which is... Uh, you know, something that you, know, you wouldn't be able to see in the static display that... No, or they'd have to build a high, you know scaffolding for you to be able to look down. So that's really a, a great way to display it is to bring it over. And, you know, while you're walking around, you can really get an appreciation for the beating that shuttles have taken over the years from, you know, multiple flights because, you know, you know, 
for instance, this shot right here, look at, you know, it's not a pristine looking skin on that vehicle. No. You know, you can see where it's probably, you know, the heat from reentry probably did a little bit of damage. Who knows, you know, what little flecks of space debris could have been flying there to, you know, take a nick out of it here and there. And well, you can tell it's been, been well used. And, you know, there's one, again, one of the advantages of having it tilted that way. You can get underneath it and get a, a pretty good view of uh, the tile system that was used, obviously, for reentry because... For the heat. You yeah. know, because that was the big thing. You know, how are we going to get this thing to land? And, and we can't just have a you know, heat shield that's going to burn off the way it did with mercury right. or, or even, uh, you know, Apollo for that matter. Yep, since we're reusing this over and over again, and you could really see where the, the heat shield took a beating. And, you know, and that was the thing that really slowed the shuttle down because, you know, we were talking about a shuttle in the 60s and Crippen and Young didn't get up until 81. So, you know, a lot of research and development had to go into that. It, it did. So uh, you mentioned a little bit earlier the, uh, oh, we have this wonderful shot here. Yes, and that is the, uh, it's the side view of the shuttle, and in the background, or in this case, possibly you could say the foreground, you can see another shot of the Canada arm. Okay. So this gives you, uh, and again, this is a pretty, bit, you know, as you might imagine, it's a rather large building to fit, you know, all these artifacts in. And there's another beautiful angle of the shuttle, and again, you can, and then, you know, people might be wondering why we're calling it the Canada arm, and yes, Canada did, you know was part of this international consortium that helped to put the shuttle together. And just a little brief history note here, a lot of Canadian engineers ended up in Florida to help us with uh, uh, everything from Mercury all the way through Apollo and the space shuttle strictly because they were building a high-tech fighter in, in the mid-50s. It was far superior to anything the U.S. had and the U.S. said, no, 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 no. We're not going to let our arms industry go downhill when it comes to building planes because you found a way to build it better. So hence, you have all these unemployed Canadian engineers who decide to go to Florida and say, well, if we can build an airplane, we can help build spacecraft. Very interesting. Wasn't aware of that uh, yeah, little so. bit of political intrigue with our neighbors to the <laughs> north. Well, hey, you know, like a good neighbor. Canada's there. There we go. And they provided the arm, which has been something that's been very you know, useful. Quite valuable. And it was, a, it was a really good shot of the arm right oh, there. Yeah. Especially with things like uh, space telescopes, lifting oh, right. them up and out of the, uh, out of the which, cargo bay. Which we'll cover in our next segment. Yes, we will. So this sounds like a really good place to uh, take a quick break. Um, if you have a question, please send us an email. Uh, we'll have the email address appear down at the bottom of the screen if uh, you haven't had a chance to uh, write it down from a previous episode. And uh, coming up next will be Term of the Month with our own Stephen Witte. And after that, we'll be back with more discussion on the Space Shuttle Program. Thanks, Don. The Term of the Month is Space Shuttle Patches. All of the space shuttle missions each had their own patch design, and the patches reflect something about what the mission is about. Uh, so I decided to continue this theme of the uh, space shuttle with the last seven mission patches from uh, specifically the Atlantis uh, uh, space shuttle. So this first one has, it looks like a, a uh, a solar panel uh, and the International Space Station in it, and so you know it has elements of the mission in it. And I went with seven uh, patches, not because there are seven astronauts on a space shuttle, or uh, or even not because uh, these were the last seven Atlantis uh, missions after the Columbia disaster. Uh, I mostly did it because these seven uh, patches happen to fit on the screen all at once. And that is the term of the month, space shuttle patches. Back to you, Don. Thanks, Stephen. 
and welcome back to our discussion about the Space Shuttle Program. I guess it's Kevin Medden, one of the uh, crew members here at Astronomy for Everyone. So we just finished talking about the Canada arm and how useful it was for lifting out certain payloads, for instance, the Hubble Space Telescope. Right. Because I, I noticed one of your questions was, why do you need a shuttle? And, well, sure. And probably the sexiest thing you can come up with are the great observatories, which Hubble is probably the, you know, the, the top one, obviously. Best, and, best known by the general public. And sure. I mean, we all remember the jokes from David Letterman when we found out it was nearsighted, you know, due to the, without going into detail, due to the mirror not being ground properly. Exactly. Yeah. So then all of a sudden, you know, the space shuttle becomes an effective tool for replacing or repairing, I should say, the shuttle or the Hubble Space Telescope. And without all those multiple repair missions, think of all the science we would not have been privy to. Well, exactly. Being able to service it, uh, being in the location that it was to be able to get to it, unlike the web, which is going up next year, where it gets up there and that's it. Yeah. Right. And, you know, when you enter this building, don't plan on running through it in a half hour, especially if you're a real space geek. You're going to want to spend a couple hours there. And they did have a movie which did feature footage from the final Hubble servicing mission. And it's still amazing to me to watch the dexterity of all these astronauts as they're putting all the pieces together. So there are, there's ample opportunity to sit, watch you know short movies, and you're not walking around the whole time. Okay. Well, we talked about the Hubble being one of the, the great uh, telescopes out there in space. There were a couple of others, and the Chandra. Chandra, uh, Chandra and uh, Spitzer, Spitzer, and yep. the Compton Gamma Ray, Gamma Ray, Ray which yep. I believe was the one that didn't didn't last the long, had the shortest lifespan. I, I as I recall, yes, yes. And and there's a, a the shot of the Canada arm again, and in the background is a life size replica, we shall shall we say, sure, of the uh, Hubble Space Telescope. Yep. And there's a close up view of the uh, Hubble before it got hit with a lot of meteorites and uh, everything else. And sure. There it is. That's our telescope. <laughs> yes, the and uh, as you can tell, the, uh, the lighting in that building left a lot to be desired in spots, so you had to use a little creativity with your uh, camera shooting there. So, now, um, the shuttle engines. Right, because again, because of the angle they, they chose to uh, hang the shuttle at, you were able to walk around and actually, and there's a shot right there, to see these massive engines that uh, propel it into, well, keep it in orbit, I guess we should say, because by that time, the external tank has run out of fuel and the SRBs are somewhere in the Atlantic Ocean. Yeah, they've been jettisoned off, so yeah. So this relies on this to uh, And, to and there's a, a, a solo shot of uh, one of the engines right there. Did you get a sense of size or just how big that is? It's a little hard to tell. Look it's it's very difficult to tell, and it, but what's interesting is is you try to compare it to the Saturn V engines, and you think that one's smaller, but I'm not sure it's small by much. <laughs> oh, okay. So between the shuttle and the yeah. Saturn V, there right. doesn't seem to be an appreciable difference. No, I, I, really, I really couldn't tell, and I'm sure somebody would who knows the stats will tell me that it's a lot smaller. Oh, Just yeah, we'll, we'll get an when, email. When you're, yeah. close, when you're close to something like that, it looks rather large. Well, yeah, sure, absolutely, absolutely. So uh, I understand, uh, in addition to looking at the shuttle and the Canada arm and the replica of the Hubble, that there are, are some other uh, fun things to do? Yes, you can tell very much that this building was oriented for education. Okay. There was, like, little plaques that said, hey, grade school kids, or hey, middle school kids, or hey, high school kids, figure this equation out and you can learn, you know, like there's an example right there. Okay. Okay, the reaction system. You know, again, a basic law of motion, something you probably know a lot more about than I would, but again, we're probably yeah, tying in a little Newton's Newtonian laws, physics. Sure. Right. Mm -hmm. And again, a way to interact with the kids to say, hey, you know, some of the stuff that you learned in your boring textbook really does play out out here. Yeah, and, and they can, can see the uh, machinery, if you want to call the shuttle a piece of machinery, that uh, was well, used to do that. Well, right, because, you know, if you're in a classroom and all you're doing is whatever, yeah. 
you lose track of different things. And here's a shot, I believe, of the shuttle simulator okay. that you can take part in and try kind of get the the effect of what it's like to you know be blasted off into space via the shuttle. Was this something similar to what the astronauts would have trained on? Do you know, or is it just scaled back just for public I'm, consumption? I'm thinking it, it has a lot of similarities, but I'm thinking because they were trying to evoke the idea of what the thrusting was like as you lifted off, that they probably you know jerry-rigged a few extra things in that the you know, because I'm sure the astronauts in the simulator didn't need the effect of blast off. They just needed to go through whatever the simulator guys were throwing at them to see if they could solve the problem. All right, so that you could get the sense of as you're taking off, as you're putting the pedal to the metal, uh, so to speak. And this is uh, another view of uh, one of the interactive things where you can actually sit in that chair, and that chair kind of represents where the commander of the shuttle would be sitting and get an idea of what it's like to, to pilot the shuttle as you're in space. All or, right. Sort of sitting on the bridge and boldly going? Or yeah, because again, you, you, you know, everybody has a short attention span, so you need these, these hands-on exhibits to really, you know, unless you're one of those geeks that sits and reads every Reads flat, all the signs, yep. Right, mm -hmm. you know. Yep, guilty. You, you could stay, yeah, you could stay <laughs> there forever. And I believe we have one more picture and this is, oh my gosh, Don, that looks like fun. Yes, that looks like a slide at a water park. Right, and the purpose of this is the glide pattern of the shuttle. You don't appreciate it from the straight on, but if you just saw this image from the side, you could, it gives you an idea of the steepness as the shuttle you know, re-enters the atmosphere and it's making its final turn to line it up for the runway either at Kennedy or at Edwards. So again, a way of telling the kids, okay, go out and have fun, but remember, there's a reason why this slide is designed the way it is, and hopefully they get that scientific connection there. It, it's good to give them some physical things to do, because as like you say, with, with not only kids, but sometimes adults, if you just have a lot of words, it's like, you know, boring. Well, right. But, I mean, but things like the simulators and the giant slide, they can really get more involved with it. So, you know, so you're getting a lot more out of it just than just seeing a building that is housing, you know, one of, you know, one of our shuttles. Now, I understand, too, that there's a part of the museum that has a special exhibit in it the, uh, for the 14 brave astronauts. Yes, uh, and there's a shot of it right there. To the left is the exhibit representing Challenger, and to the right is Columbia. And again, as most of you know, Challenger was an accident at liftoff, and Columbia was an accident at reentry. Yes. And, you know, interestingly enough, though, in the case of Columbia, it had a, on its first uh, trip up with Crippen and Young, it had a strike on a wing, and they were concerned about it, just as they were with the Columbia on her final mission. And it's, it's kind of interesting how the various government entities have to work together. So even when Crippen and Young were up there, we had spy satellites trying to match their orbit with the orbit of the shuttle so they could get a shot underneath to make sure none of the tiles were disturbed. And little did they know that that was going to be a dress rehearsal for the real thing. Because obviously they, they determined that Crippen and Young were fine and they landed safely. But I think that was the original shot. Because if, if you recall the history of the shuttle program, what did we hear? Oh, it was going to go up 50, 60 times a year, and that was going to drop the cost per launch to dirt cheap. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, yeah. sometimes, you know, the economists should stay out of things. Yeah. Because yeah. the shuttle is a little more complicated, I think, than they bargained for. Yeah, it wasn't a taxi cab running around on a city street. No, and. Uh, and to kind of round this off, I have a couple of books here that we can help give people a really good idea of the shuttle program. The first one's written by Roland White, and it's called Into the Black. Now, this book in particular is the total history of the space shuttle, but it specifically is for Columbia, 
and for Crippen and Young. So you, you get an idea of all the backroom deals that were made when at first we thought the Department of Defense was going to use the shuttle at Vandenberg, which is in California, because the dream was we would shoot the shuttle out in a polar orbit at Vandenberg. And of course, what kind of orbit do spy satellites like? Polar. Yeah, yeah. you know, mm -hmm. because it, especially when your enemy is Russia, and Russia takes up a pretty big you know, part of the world. And the next book is Bringing Columbia Home. And again, as you might imagine, it's the last flight of Columbia. But it's more than just the astronauts passing away in the accident. It's kind of more than, it's all the people in Louisiana and Texas getting together. Multiple government agencies that actually checked their egos at the door the way you're supposed to and said, we're here to help. You know, we're not going to be the top dog. They're not going to be the top dog. We're here to work together. And it's a really fascinating book. If you, if you want an idea of what happens after something, you know, disintegrates like a tragedy Columbia. like this sure. right you know and as a matter of fact in one of the buildings at the kennedy space center 40 percent of columbia has been reconstructed and the way they set it up was you are allowed if you're a researcher you are allowed to request from nasa a piece of the shuttle you can take it to your laboratory and you can do research with it and experiment with it and if you think your results are something that nasa would need to know for you know further information as space flight continues, you know, you can do that. And so the citizen scientist is really part of that program. Because obviously now we have no idea when we are next going to see an American astronaut in space on a NASA piece of equipment. Obviously we have plenty of people like, you know, Elon Musk who wanna get up, you know, sooner, but you know, the fact of the matter is you know, we haven't had a, an American astronaut in an American vehicle since the last shuttle landed. Yeah, back in 2011. So. Well, Kevin, i got to tell you, this has been a very interesting look at not only the museum aspect, but also looking at the, uh, the problems that we had with uh, Columbia and with Challenger. Kind of remember those folks as well. So we hope you've enjoyed the uh, presentation. Uh, if you'd like to visit our website, we are always glad to have you come there, the club website. And Kevin, thanks for being a part of the show, bringing this interesting oh, topic. Thanks for having me. I appreciate oh, sure. it. To our visitors. And coming up next is What's Up in the Night Sky with Stephen Witte. What's up in the night sky for April 2018? Uh, we just had uh, the uh, equinox the, in March. Uh, the sun rises uh, from 7.15 to 6.30 in the morning and sets at 7.59 to 8.31 in the evening. Uh, twilight, that is uh, astronomical night, is between 97 and 109 minutes before and after the rising and setting of the sun. Uh, uh, March ended with a full moon. So April uh, has the third quarter on April 8th, which is quite a ways into the month for not having a full moon. Uh, new moon is on the 15th. The first quarter is April 22nd, and the full moon is on April 29th. Um, so we next move to a solar system shot where we're going to talk mostly about Uranus. Uh, on April 29th, and that's when this system, the solar system shot is, uh, is produced for, Uranus is in superior conjunction. That's when it's on the other side of the sun from the Earth. So Uranus is not uh, a planet that you're going to be uh, seeing 
Uranus uh, also, oddly enough, crosses from Pisces to Aries this month, you know, when we're not seeing it. And, and it is unusual for Uranus to move from one constellation to another because it's so far out that it moves so slowly around, it takes so long to go. Um, Mercury and um, Neptune and Mars and believe it or not, Pluto and Jupiter are all in the morning sky. So here we have it on the 29th. Uh, and the 29th is also special for Mercury where, which has its maximum western elongation on the 29th. So here at 5.50 in the morning, we have Mercury uh, on the left closest to the sun. Then we have, uh, oh, and this greatest elongation is also bigger than usual because uh, Mercury is at aphelion on April 23rd. That's its farthest from the sun. So that means that it's pushed a little bit farther away, you know, from uh, uh, the Earth's perspective. Uh, Neptune is in Aquarius. It rises at 624 to 4:32, and it's best at the end of the month. At the end of the month, as is Mercury, because Mercury starts out on the first in inferior conjunction. So it's right smack in the sun, between the sun and us. Uh, Mars is in Sagittarius. It rises uh, from 3 to 2 uh, in the morning. Uh, it's best at, at the end of the month. Right by the M in the label Mars, that's where Pluto is. It's magnitude 14.7, so you'll need a 10-inch telescope to see it. It's not going to be that good. July, I think, is better uh, for Pluto. And Jupiter is in uh, Libra. It rises at 11.16 p.m. to 9.07 p.m. It's best really at the beginning of the month, uh, just slightly. Um, uh, but the transit of Jupiter, that is its highest in the sky, is at 4 a.m. to 2 a.m. over the month. So that's actually a better time to look at it. Uh, Venus is in Aries. And, uh, and moves to Taurus through the month. It sets at 11.35 to 10.47. It's best at the beginning of the month a little bit. It's uh, uh, just because it's later and it, the sky is darker. Uh, so uh, lastly, we have a, uh, a comet, Pan-STARRS C 2016 R2. Uh, it was discovered on September 7th of 2016. It moves from Perseus to Auriga this month. It's eighth magnitude, so you'll need binoculars. And it's below Ceres in Cancer in the middle of the month. And we also have on the 22nd the Lyrid, the Lyrid meteor shower. Now, all of the stuff that I normally say, dress over warm to see it. Um, but also, uh, because the first quarter moon is on April 22nd, it's best in the morning. So that's what's up in the night sky for April 2018.